God came to us to seek and to save that which was lost. He raised the man from among us. He, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, laid the foundation. What I'm doing is something that comes from him through me and the thing that he uses in me to do the work is my faith in him and the word that he taught to produce men and women who wanted to clean up their life and build an independent nation for the glory of God. testimony on national network view the enemy of truth has always published a manufactured falsehood against the honorable minister louis farrakhan and the nation of islam one controversial figure that they love to use is the late malcolm x here is a clip from the godfather of harlem produced by disney tv wolf at large today my guest in place of the honorable elijah muhammad is the national spokesman for the nation of islam Minister Malcolm X. Good day, Mr. X. Good day, sir. The hardships for the black man in America are hardships for white America as well. They just don't know it yet. See, oppression is not just a one-way street, and neither are its cause. You are referring to President Kennedy's assassination. Um, I have no comment on that. You're a national spokesman for a religion that advocates violence, and you have no comment. Sir, I'd like to make it clear. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad does not advocate violence. He advocates self-defense against oppressors. And yet the nation stands accused of being all talk and no action. By design, this film does not portray the Nation of Islam or Malcolm X accurately. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has given student minister Brother Dimitri Muhammad of the NOI Research Department permission to address the Malcolm X controversy. He is the author of a book titled, Didn't Y'all Kill Malcolm? He is the first and only member of the Nation of Islam to write a book about our slain brother. Here to speak about these subjects and other topics of consequence from researchminister.com, the research minister and brother Dimitri is our brother, brother Dimitri Muhammad. Salam alaikum. Good seeing you, man. Thank you, my brother. I know you, 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 you're you busy and you're constantly working on some project that is for the betterment of our nation and the defense of our nation and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And we thank you for you uh, affording us this opportunity to interview today. So well, the, minister the first question. Yes, sir. The first question that we want to ask, Brother Dimitri, is we open the show with a report highlighting how you recently authored a book, uh, the first written by someone from within the ranks of the Nation of Islam addressing the history of Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam. My question to you is, why do you think it has taken 54 years for a book about this controversial history to be written by someone from amongst our ranks? Brother Minister Willie, thank you once again for allowing me the privilege and the opportunity to be on your wonderful podcast. Uh, every opportunity that I can, I tune in to see and to witness and to behold the great testimonies of, of many of our brothers and sisters who have had encounters with the person and the ministry of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And I am delighted to be a part of it once again. Uh, as you reference our latest work, uh, the book entitled, But Didn't You Kill Malcolm? Coming uh, 50 plus years after the assassination of Malcolm X. Uh, you know, in the Nation of Islam, we had for many years uh, defended ourselves against the charge uh, that we were responsible uh, for the assassination of Malcolm X. Uh, most of the time, this was done through lectures, uh, press conferences, question and answer sessions, uh, and occasionally news articles. Uh, we believe that, you know, God is, uh, as they say in the church, he's always on time. Uh, and so we believe that 
uh, the occasion and the timing uh, was such that Allah, God, uh, would bless us to produce a work that would come at this time uh, to vindicate not only the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the nation of Islam, but also to vindicate the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, who it is no secret has been the point person who has sat in the seat of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad for the last 40 plus years. And you will bear witness and members uh, in the audience will bear witness uh, the establishment, the white power structure in America hated Minister Malcolm X. Uh, they hated him in life and they hated him in death. You don't see Malcolm becoming uh, this pop culture icon again until the mid to late 80s and on into the 90s when, as we argue in our book and we document how it was a choice to resurrect Brother Malcolm, uh, to make him an opponent of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, as Minister Farrakhan was building momentum and doing something that no one really believed he would be able to do. And that was to rebuild the work of his teacher, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And when the powers that be looked around, they could not find any living leader who had the charisma, the intellect, the magnetism, and the love of the people to really rival Minister Farrakhan. So we say that they went into the graveyard of deceased black leaders and they found Minister Malcolm X and they conceived of a plan and a propaganda strategy. Uh, we discuss it as even a military psychological styled operation whereby Minister Mal Malcolm X would be resurrected from beyond the grave and he would be portrayed, his image would be sanitized and he would be portrayed as an icon for, for black youth uh, while at the same time installing into the minds and thinking of many of the youth that it was Minister Farrakhan and the nation who was responsible for Brother Malcolm's death. So I think that this book has taken time to produce, uh, but I believe that it is at the right time uh, to address uh, this controversy that even at this late date of 2021 uh, has not subsided because again, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the rebuilding of the nation of Islam proves to be relevant, proves to be impactful, and prove to continue to be a thorn in the side of those who have a genocidal plot uh, plan for black people in America and around the world. I, I can't hear you, Minister Willie. Working on that. So thank you. Uh, as you are aware, there are hundreds of books written about Malcolm X, probably thousands, right? And many of them are not favorable about the Nation of Islam and our position. For the reader who reads your book, what false accusations against the Nation of Islam, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, other than some of what you, you just mentioned, that they can read rebuttals of, that they will be, you know, be introduced to rebuttals of? Well, uh, that's a great question. There are many books that have been written about Minister Malcolm X and his life and his work. We did not set out to write and to publish a biography of Minister Malcolm X. We set out to write uh, and to publish a book that would deal specifically with the controversies surrounding Brother Minister Malcolm's assassination and how Brother Minister Malcolm's assassination has actually been weaponized to divide us in the black community, uh, specifically by injuring the name and the reputation of the leadership of the Nation of Islam and literally castigating an entire religion uh, for this historic uh, political assassination. And so 
when you look at the outline and the uh, table of contents, you see we attack head on the myths and the controversies that most people are familiar with that are actually component parts of the psychological operation whereby black youth have been falsely made to believe that the nation of Islam should be hated instead of loved because after all, as they ask us the question, hey, didn't y'all kill Malcolm? And so we uh, go into the mythology of Malcolm having a conversion experience after first seeing white Muslims in the Middle East. We go after the mythology concerning the domestic life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and we examine his noble morality in contrast and stark contrast against all of the evil slander that has been uh, attached to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh, again, we address how uh, there has been a deliberate effort. Once upon a time, that effort sought to blame the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. But in the last 40 years, uh, the rebuilding of the nation has been stymied by the campaign to put Minister Farrakhan and to finger Minister Farrakhan as being personally responsible for Brother Malcolm's assassination. Uh, we also address uh, many of the um, uh, aspects of the actual assassination itself. Uh, and we introduced new research that follows uh, Minister Farrakhan's controversy with uh, modern day Jewish leaders. And we look and we document uh, this same opposition from groups like the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith. Uh, and we document and we locate them as being players in uh, Minister Malcolm's assassination. And this is of course, uh, new and eye opening for people who may have read and been familiar with uh, Malcolm's assassination, but uh, have never looked uh, in this uh, direction. And I think uh, uh, the, the information and the documentation that we present throughout the book is uh, quite powerful and compelling. And they they definitely are, and I definitely enjoy uh, reading the book. Now, the, the, the promo image that we use to promote this actual show is you with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is a very beautiful, uh, it is a very, very beautiful picture. And from my talks with you, is the minister is actually holding the book that we are actually uh, discussing, right? So can you share with us just that moment, what was happening at that moment, and any specific guidance that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan gave you as you began to, as you were working on this book from the beginning to the end, and even up until this point? I have to thank Brother Abdul Kiyam Muhammad, who took that picture. Actually, Minister Farrakhan is, is not holding uh, the book that we are discussing, but didn't you kill Malcolm? He is actually holding another book that we did publish, which is called The Invincible Truth, Volume Two, uh, The Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad's New Amsterdam News Articles Collection. Uh, but we did spend uh, hours, uh, an entire day, with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan after he had spent uh, at least a week or two uh, reading our manuscript. And so we were blessed to receive great guidance and encouragement from our beloved minister uh, with this subject. And I think that one of the things that the minister was and has been concerned about is that those of us who are his students uh, take his spirit and take his position with respect to various issues uh, that manifest in public life. And of course, Malcolm X and his assassination is uh, one such issue it is wrong, as I have articulated, for people to assume that Minister Farrakhan and the rebuilt nation of Islam are haters 
of Minister Malcolm X. Uh, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan had a personal relationship with Minister Malcolm. So many people, Minister Willie, have written about Minister Malcolm, have delivered speeches and lectures about Minister Malcolm, and they are free to say what they think. They are free to offer their opinion. But the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan speaks of Brother Minister Malcolm from a first uh, person perspective because he was a brother, a friend, uh, an acolyte, if you will, a little brother and a uh, slash student under the leadership of Minister Malcolm. And so Minister Malcolm uh, was and is loved by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, his family, uh, and, and the Nation of Islam. Uh, like any people, and we discuss this in the book, like any people who are a spiritual people or who are a deeply religious people, uh, love oftentimes uh, breaks and fractures whenever there appears to be some departure from the spiritual principles or the religious teachings that have uh, previously served as a glue and a bond that produces a brotherhood. So the disagreement that Minister Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam have had over the years is not with really Malcolm X and his work, but is really with how Minister Malcolm ended his life. And I document uh, in my book, Minister Willie, uh, that Minister Malcolm, had he lived, would have either come back and become a registered member again of the Nation of Islam, or he would have gone on to become a political uh, and strategic ally. Certainly he would have been a fellow co-religionist of the Nation of Islam, Muslims, uh, but he would not have uh, been an adversary. There are men, there's much evidence and much testimony of those who knew him uh, that suggest that Malcolm was seeking to make his way back into the nation. And of course, you have heard Minister Farrakhan say uh, that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, leave Malcolm alone. And we actually document that. We actually document the words of the most Honorable Elijah Muhammad that were published in the Muhammad Speaks newspaper, where he publicly stated that Minister Malcolm was not a hypocrite and that he was being uh, disciplined and that his work was not the work of a man that was a hypocrite. And so, uh, we document that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad uh, believed and had faith and confidence that Minister Malcolm, after his 90-day suspension, uh, would return into the nation. A lot of people outside of the nation, Minister Willie, you know, don't realize, you know, that, you know, Minister Malcolm was not the first believer to have to, to, have to serve a time uh, uh, in suspension. Uh, it has happened before Minister Malcolm. It has happened since Minister Malcolm. It is never the belief or the expectation that the brother or the sister who has been suspended for violating one of the laws that we believe have been given to us by Allah God in the person of Master Far Muhammad. He came and he gave to us a law to live by. He taught us that we were like the children of Israel in the Bible. So when Moses was raised by Jehovah in the Old Testament, he preached an exodus, but he also preached that the children of Israel had to live according to a law, the law of the Ten Commandments, because as long as they had been slaves in Egypt, they had taken on the immoral life and the irreligious life of the Egyptians. And so for the Egyptians, separation was a part of sanctification. So likewise, it has been in the nation of Islam. We live by a moral code, we live by a law. And when members break that, uh, they serve a period of time uh, to themselves so that they can work on themselves and they can address whatever issues that uh, lingers within them that cause them to violate that law. And after that time has expired, they return to be members in good standing. And this was the 
the hope of, of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad with regard to Minister Malcolm X. But as we document, uh, the federal government, the FBI, they have taken credit for creating factions within the Nation of Islam because they were trying to destroy the Nation of Islam. And they point to Malcolm X's assassination as an example of the most successful COINTELPRO or counterintelligence program uh, operations ever. Uh, matter of fact, you find that the tactics, the maneuvers, uh, the deceitful practices that they experimented on with respect to the Nation of Islam that caused Minister Malcolm X to be assassinated, they would go on to use uh, to tear down and to destroy uh, the Black Panther Party who were in many ways the ideological offspring of Minister Malcolm X. They, the early Panther leaders uh, were clear that Minister Malcolm inspired their work. And you even saw in their publications that they had a 10 point program. And that 10 point program of what the Panthers want uh, was modeled after what the Muslims want. That is printed on the back page of the final call, once upon a time printed on the back page of Muhammad Speaks. So, you know, we wanna have a conversation about the assassination of Malcolm X. We can't have that conversation without talking about J. Edgar Hoover, the counterintelligence program of the FBI. Uh, and now with, with, with the book that we were blessed to publish, we also have to discuss uh, the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith. And we show in our book that J. Edgar Hoover mandated that all of his offices of the FBI uh, cooperate with the ADL. Now, that's very, very significant because throughout the history of the Nation of Islam, the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith have dogged our trail, seeking to portray us and our leadership as being anti-Semitic and even working diligently uh, to cause us uh, not to be able to do business in certain cities and even work to get certain Muslims who were employed in the federal government fired. Right. So, you know, there are many things that this organization that claims to represent the Jewish people have done uh, to destroy the nation of Islam. And lo and behold, uh, we find them uh, on the scene, literally, uh, at Malcolm's assassination. Wow, man, that's so much. And this is why it's very important for your readers, for those who are viewing and watching this, to actually get the book. And so what we're going to do right now, we're going to pause and get ready for our some of our announcements. So I thank all of you all for tuning in to National Network View. We're going to pause for these few announce these few announcements and we'll be, be right back with our guests. National Network View was recently banned from the media platform YouTube.com. Within 12 hours, the NNV IT department quickly sprung into action with the independent service system to back NNVNews.com. The nation's news network is now streaming content 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As we extend gratitude for the believers' financial support through donations, this media activism will not stop. Please continue to be a part of a force that powers truth in journalism. Your support helps to combat false media. Donate to NNV News. This is Clifton Muhammad with National Network View. He anointed our head with oil. Till I cut running through. He who Master Farah Muhammad. That is he. Be a part of the force that powers truth in journalism. Your support helps to combat false media. Cash App NNV News. And we are back, and this is I Have a Testimony with Brother Willie Muhammad with our very special guest, Brother Demetri Muhammad, who was just talking about more about what's covered in his book. And in his response, he brought out a very good point that Malcolm X wasn't the first person in the Nation of Islam, and sure not the last, that has been given time for some infraction. But when they are, when we are, it's always with the hope and expect, the hope 
and the expectation that we will return and we'll be much stronger than we were before. So now, Brother Dimitri, I, um, over the last decade or so, since we're talking about your book, we, we are seeing more and more members of the Nation of Islam writing books on a variety of aspects related to the Nation of Islam. That's the history, the theology, and the culture. So what do you see as the significance of this activity for the Nation of Islam? I think, Minister Willie, what we are witnessing is the result of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan approach to representing the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. One of the things that made Minister Farrakhan uh, the most successful of all of the honorable Elijah Muhammad's ministers is number one, he deeply to the core of his being believed and believes that the honorable Elijah Muhammad is a divine servant of Allah God. This means that he believes that the words of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad are divine revelation. Well, people who are handling divine revelation, they understand that divine revelation is filled with profound wisdom, deep deep truth and hidden meaning that you can access if you have love in your heart and you sincerely study it as opposed to just reciting it. So Minister Farrakhan's representation of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's message has famously attracted the minds of men and women who in this modern age where so-called organized religion is waning as opposed to waxing in terms of its appeal among the masses, Minister Farrakhan's unique ministry and representation have attracted people who believe in God who know that there's a higher power, but understand that old world Islam, old world Christianity, old world Judaism uh, is insufficient to help us to understand the world in which we live with all of its myriad of problems uh, and pathologies. And so now among the membership, of the nation of Islam. And this is, this is an adjustment for many people who have been outside the nation looking upon the nation. Many people who used to look at us, they marveled and admired at the work of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And even if they didn't agree with the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, they would give him the proverbial tip of the hat a salute, an attaboy, if you will. Why? Because his work is legendary for being able to reform people that other institutions throughout America could not reform and benefit. So the, the party line about the nation of Islam, Minister Willie, is that yet a nation is good for people who used to be in gangs, for people who used to be pimps, hustlers, ex-cons, drug addicts, prostitutes. And so you see this, especially in the academic world. The academic world right now is really, you know, struggling to deal with Minister Farrakhan's students. Why? Because they have treated us the way anthropologists treat tribes that are in the Amazon jungle. When an anthropologist goes and he discovers a tribe in the Amazon jungle that the, the, the general public has no knowledge of, he begins to study them and then he wants to pad his resume. He wants to add to his uh, professional accomplishments that he discovered this tribe and he was able to decipher their culture, 
come to understand them, build some affinity with them. And then he becomes the gatekeeper to them, interpreting them to the rest of the world. And so this is how the nation of Islam has been treated. But again, the unique ministry uh, and representation of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad provided for uh, by the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan now has given birth to a burgeoning group of intellectuals whose approach to Islam is not the same approach that you even see in the classical Islamic world. The students of Minister Farrakhan, again, that term student, we are studying first and foremost, the body of knowledge that was given to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we are finding vindication for Muhammad's message. This, of course, Minister Willie uh, makes me put uh, my student minister hat on for a moment because I'm reminded of a verse or an ayat in the Holy Quran. It's in Surah 28, ayat number 35, I believe. And in this ayat, Moses prays to Allah that he would give him Aaron as a helper and as one who would confirm him. Look at the language in the English translation to confirm him. Moses was the one that received revelation from God. But revelation requires confirmation and that confirmation is facilitated with documentation. So you ask the question, why now is so many students of Minister Farrakhan taking to publishing? It is because Minister Farrakhan's divine purpose from Allah is to serve as a confirmation that what Allah gave to his teacher, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, is in fact the truth and is in fact from the, the divine as its source and origin. And so we are, those of us who are his students, uh, we are like, you know, those who are helpers to the minister. And if our work is good, which we must continue to strive to ensure that we elevate the standard of our work. But if our work is good, then our work goes to help Minister Farrakhan be what Allah called him to be as the Aaron to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's Moses and that he and his ministry confirms what Allah gave to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that, and that it is in fact divine revelation. Wow, man. And it's time is time is moving fast. We're up, up, we're up again at another wow. commercial break. So uh, just hold fast for one second. For those who are making comments, who are tuning in, we appreciate you all for tuning into a tuning into the National Network View. And we're going to pause for another moment and bring our brother back uh, to hear more about his work and some other questions that we want to ask. But we're going to pause for these these brief announcements. Thank you for tuning in. Greetings. This is Tariqa Shakir Muhammad with National. Greetings. This is Tariqa Shakir Muhammad with National Network View. This week's final call cover story reads, Respect and Protect the Black Woman. On the freezing night of February 21st, 2019, Chicago police raid the home of Anjanette Young, leaving her nude and handcuffed after smashing down her door. Protesters gathered at police headquarters with intense anger and demand justice. The outrage and pain runs deep after another incident of foul play by police on a black woman. To read more, subscribe to FinalCallDigital.com. And thank you for tuning in to NBV News. Please share your thoughts with us in the comments section below. Follow us on social media. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel, NNV News. This is Tariqa Shakir Muhammad with NNVNews.com. Part of the force that powers truth in journalism. Your support helps to combat false media. Cash App 
NNV News. And we're back with I Have a Testimony. This is your brother, brother Willie Muhammad, and we have our guest, brother Dimitri Muhammad. And before I get into the next questions, I got to give my people a shout out who work behind the boards. Brother Musa and Sister Kenya, thank you all. You see all of this going on. It's not me, so I'm grateful for their help. So I normally ask this question in the beginning of the interview, Brother Dimitri, but I decided to just, I wanted us to talk about the Malcolm X, or hear you talk about the Malcolm X uh, issue in the book. But the question I want to ask you, how did you become introduced to the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and then make the decision to, to join? I was a teenager and my father had began to study the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and he introduced it to me and I began to study it and I joined the Nation of Islam as a teenager. I was a freshman in high school when I joined the Nation of Islam and became a registered member at the age of 15. Are you, while well, I at the age of 15 is when you actually, you join. Yes, sir. Man, so sir. like, how was that? Like, you know, at the age of 15, you're writing maybe what, 10th grade? Like, how do you, how did you handle the pressures? Because I can imagine there are teenagers now in the Nation of Islam who were born and they have that pressure. And in addition to those who may be at that age and they want to join, like, how did you over, how did you stand strong to make that decision and you continue to where you are now? I don't know how I became uh, strong to, to be able to, to go through it. The only way I could answer that is that I really did love the teachings. And once I began to study the teachings, every time I would study it, I would go deeper into it to see the truth of it. And so in spite of opposition from members of my biological family, in spite of opposition from my peers, in spite of opposition from even teachers and, and members of the community, uh, I could never walk away from what I was actually studying myself. And this is why I always encourage uh, the believers, you know, to study because I'm just like the next person. I love to hear good preaching. I love to hear good teaching. Uh, shout out to my brother and colleague on the research team, student minister, Dr. Wesley. I tuned in this morning to hear his wonderful lecture and he did a wonderful job. But, you know, if you never go and study for yourself, you won't know that you know it for yourself. You will always have, I believe, a kernel of doubt that whispers, well, you just heard someone else say this. You don't know this for yourself. And so study has to be a part of the recipe for longevity in a life of faith, in my humble judgment. And so the more I study his teachings, growing up in the Mississippi Delta, I found that what the most honorable Elijah Muhammad was saying and what Minister Farrakhan was preaching was, was so profound. And I'm happy to say that 30 years later, uh, I, I still am excited. I still am thrilled. I still am bowled over and, and in awe, admiring uh, the simple and plain words of that marvelous human being, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And of course, his student uh, and greatest helper, the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, you know, to study uh, the words and the teachings of these two men, again, who are among us, like a modern Moses and Aaron, but of course there's so much more than that. But they have given to us 
uh, the kind of wisdom. And, and I emphasize wisdom because there are a lot of knowledgeable and informative people in the black community. But when you are talking about what is in the nation of Islam, you are talking about wisdom. And we are people who have been so foolish, even in our pursuit of knowledge and information, we are often and frequently foolish. I sometimes sit back and I shake my head looking at many knowledgeable and informative brothers and sisters who argue and fight and become, uh, you know, so foul as they argue publicly with one another on social media. And I think to myself, these are some of the most intelligent brothers and sisters that I've ever heard, yet they are acting as their enemies of one another. And so wisdom, which is the application, the skillful and the prudent and the judicious application of knowledge uh, is what you find among us in the nation. And it is just so soul satisfying if you spend time with it and study it and nurse from it. And I had that feeling at 15 and I have that feeling today uh, a few years older than 15. Praise be to Allah. And that's a good segue into my next question. To go from joining at the age of 15, having that love for the teachings, continuing to have that love for the teachings, and now years later you find yourself as a member of the Nation of Islam's uh, research group, right? So how does it feel to be a part of such a historic group? And how did you become a member of the group? I became a member at the invitation and the selection of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in the year 2010. It feels wonderful. I am elated and perpetually excited to be a helper to Minister Farrakhan in this regard. It was never something that I sought because prior to its actual assembly and formation in 2010, it was not a research team uh, like it is today. There were earlier uh, groupings that the minister would assemble of close aides and, and laborers who would help him as he uh, handled uh, and dealt with certain weighty messages that Allah would place upon his heart and mind. So it wasn't something that, you know, was advertised that you could, could be a part of in my early years as a member of the nation. Uh, but I'm very grateful and very honored uh, to be able to uh, be a part of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's research team. Uh, and uh, I pray that he continues to find a utility in what I have attempted to provide in way of service to him and this great cause. Beautiful, man. And the topic or the title of this show is I Have a Testimony. And the question I want to ask you, and I ask many people this, from your perspective, why is it important for those who have been positively impacted by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to testify of such when they have the chance from your perspective? Well, I would answer that first from the perspective of a believer. The scripture says that at the end of this world, Satan would be so angry and so filled with wrath at the Messiah and those who believe in him and follow him that he would seek to destroy them. But the Bible says that they were able to overcome the dragon, which is a symbolic reference to Satan, uh, through two things. The Bible says, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. You know, your platform that is specifically called I Have a Testimony, as well as other great platforms of believers that also allow brothers and sisters to give a testimony uh, is so enriching 
And it is so comforting uh, as a believer to hear uh, the stories, the testimonies, the life experiences of other believers, many of whom I have admired from afar as a, a quote unquote little believer, even though there are no big eyes and there are no little U's within our nation, yet coming in as a neophyte uh, believer, again, as a teenager, many of the people that you have interviewed, Minister Willie, were people that I saw on television. Uh, I, I, I watched uh, speak at Mosque Maryam or speak in other mosques around the nation or, or, or important laborers and officials. And so, you know, to hear their testimony, uh, it, it, it nourishes the heart of the believer. And we need that in these trying times. It really is like a dose of pastoral care that we are able to have a way to connect with one another and hear each other's uh, triumphs and even ups and downs as we have all did the best that we could uh, in our unique journey uh, and our life of faith. Uh, but I would also say that in terms of the preservation of our history as a nation, as a unique spiritual community within America, these testimonies I hope at some point can be transcribed and preserved in written form because they represent a certain kind of treasure. That treasure is important for us to retain ownership of our narrative. Again, those in the uh, world of academia, that they would like to be the controllers and the owners of the narrative of the nation of Islam. They would like to treat us again as a tribal group that they uniquely and exclusively uh, have knowledge of that they can interpret to everyone else. And so your work uh, and the work again of others who have a testimony style podcast is very, very important. And lastly, but certainly not last in terms of importance is that these testimonies help to vindicate the noble name and person of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. You know, Minister Willie, that we also published a book called Who Do They Say I Am? The Vindication of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And the basis of that book are uh, quotes and testimonies of persons we would consider high profile or prominent in some way, shape or form. Uh, because uh, the Jewish leadership have really worked to marginalize Minister Farrakhan. They have really desired isolation for the purpose of assassination. But Allah God has not allowed the minister to be isolated. The Nation of Islam, as I heard uh, Minister Abdul Halim Muhammad say last night on a podcast, I liked how he said that the nation at this point, we are woven into the black community. You cannot get rid of us. And so uh, testimonies of all kinds help us to document that the real Louis Farrakhan is in stark contrast to the Louis Farrakhan that you hear described and pejoratively dubbed and negatively portrayed in the mainstream media. Uh, and so to have uh, these testimonies uh, really is kind of like, I would say, what Jesus should have had in the New Testament. Think about it, Minister Willie. The man with the withered hand, the woman with the issue of blood, the multitudes who were fed with fish and bread, Lazarus, uh, the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. All of these people in the New Testament were actual witnesses to the good of Jesus. Yet when it came time for Jesus's hour of trial and crucifixion, 
none of these witnesses step forward to provide their testimony. Well, I don't know if people have realized it or not, but when they appear on your program, Minister Willie, uh, they are documenting their testimony as a witness to the goodness of God as it has beautifully manifested itself in the person of Minister Farrakhan and such testimonies uh, can be used uh, in future dates uh, in a positive way, I guess, is like when they say, you know, what you can and say uh, can be used not against you in this instance, uh, but on your behalf and certainly on behalf of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Praise be to Allah. And I can tell you, those were two questions that I had to ask you, but you actually went into them without me asking. So Allah's hand was definitely into that and your responses were beautiful, man. So thank you for that. And I'll transition to the next question because we talked about this and you, I've heard about this meeting before, but you kind of elaborated a little more about it where um, in one of our brotherly talks, you mentioned how you observed when the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan invited economists to the palace to examine and give feedback on the relaunching of the economic blueprint, right? So can you share with the viewing audience how one diverse of a group of economists were invited and how the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan sought a difference of thought? It's kind of like three parts. So one, how the group was diverse, how the minister intentionally sought people who had a difference of thought and how by the end of the actual gathering, how many people he won over. Minister Willie, that was a great event that we were blessed to participate in and to help to plan. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan desired to reintroduce Muhammad's economic blueprint, which uh, briefly stated is that if everybody in Black America would set aside just a nickel per week, 35 cents per week to be given over into a national treasury where we would first purchase land, begin to grow food, and begin to take the steps necessary to become an independent people. Uh, this plan was conceived of by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And again, you know, this is not called the second rise or the second resurrection. This is called the rebuilding. That's key language. Because when you are rebuilding, you're not building something using a new blueprint or a new model. You are building based upon the existing model and the existing blueprint. So the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has gone about the work of rebuilding what his father and teacher the eternal leader of the nation of Islam, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad built initially, but was torn down by enemies. And so when the minister thought to reintroduce the economic blueprint, obviously the program originally conceived by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, I believe was in the 1960s. So Minister Farrakhan wanted to present the blueprint to a diverse group of economists to see if the economic principles at work that made the economic blueprint successful originally in the 60s could make it successful in today's time. So the minister wanted Muslim economists. He wanted Christian economists. He wanted Jewish economists. He wanted socialist economists. He wanted democratic economists. He wanted black economists. He wanted white economists. Um, he wanted to be benefited by the thinking of those who had expertise in the area of economics 
finance, business, et cetera. And so we uh, had the meeting and it was a wonderful meeting. And I can tell you that even though some of them agreed to participate in the meeting, there was obviously some who were very, very excited to be there, quite frankly. I remember a white professor, and I forget his name, but he was interviewed by the final call some years ago. But I remember, I think it was Professor Yates, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but I was there when he and his wife came, and they were so excited to be there that they called their children. And they told their children, guess where I am? I'm meeting with Minister Farrakhan. There's a white professor and his wife. And not only were they excited, but their children were excited. So that was very intriguing because, of course, not only people say, didn't y'all kill Malcolm? But they all always ask, well, don't y'all hate white people? You know, there's so many myths surrounding us that as ministers in the nation, and you know this, Minister Willie, as well as anyone, uh, we have to spend a lot of our time before we can even teach what we believe, just addressing myths and controversies. But I digress. And uh, Kelvin Boston was there from the color of money. Dr. Boyce Watkins was there. Uh, the minister had invited Dr. Naeem Akbar, but Dr. Naeem Akbar had a previous engagement and could not attend. But he sent the minister a beautiful letter letting the minister know that he wholeheartedly agreed with the three-year economic program, the, econ the Muhammad's economic blueprint. And uh, he had other very uh, beautiful words to share with his brother, Minister Farrakhan. And, uh, and so again, some of those may have been a little bit tepid, a little bit cautious early on, but the minister hosted that array of economists at his home for dinner that evening. And it was amazing to see the high level of civilization that if you ever go to dinner with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, you know it is the most dignified, the most refined uh, setting that one might find themselves in. Not to mention that the food is the best food that you will ever consume. So it was really beautiful and fascinating to see these erudite scholars and giants in the uh, world of academia and economics really become very humbled by Minister Farrakhan's graciousness as a host to them, introducing them to members of his family members of his staff, you know, allowing them to eat, you know, as, as, as much as they wanted to eat and ask him whatever questions they wanted to ask. And they were, some of them actually said, Minister Willie, you know, Minister Farrakhan, this what we're experiencing now should be shown to the world because people don't see and associate this when they hear the name Louis Farrakhan. Wow. And so by the by the end of the night, you know, they all were, you know, you know, minister, can we take a picture with you? Minister, you know, can can we get a hug? Minister, would you sign this for me? And so you saw it was a beautiful day that represented so much in terms of Minister Farrakhan's character. Minister Farrakhan's disposition as a student because, you know, it's one thing to call people who have expertise to the table, but sometimes people call people of expertise to the table just for show, uh, don't actually really be interested in what they have to say. But that whole day during that meeting, Minister Farrakhan listened and he wrote notes and he did not interject as those economists, some had very uh, different perspectives, uh, different opinions, uh, even making certain economic recommendations that they thought he should take. But he never 
you know, acted as though, you know, uh, I brought you here and I brought you here just to hear what I have to say and is my way or the highway. That was not Minister Farrakhan's uh, disposition. The wow. minister was very humble and he said and he listened and he took notes and he carefully thought and he weighed uh, what they had to say. And then he took all of that uh, as advice in his subsequent steps regarding Muhammad's economic blueprint. Wow, beautiful, man. And just like what you said, that is a meeting that the public needs to see because it goes against this, this manufactured uh, image that they are putting out on the minister. So we have about four more questions and I'll get to this one. So in a Final Call newspaper column that you wrote titled Empathy, Minister Farrakhan's Conflict Resolution and the Restoration of Brotherhood, you said the following words, quote, an important aspect of peaceful conflict resolution is the development of the ability to empathize with those whom we have a disagreement with. I am studying the characteristic of empathy based upon witnessing it on display in the life of my teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, end of quote. Can you share with the audience and those who may have not read that article, or even heard you talk about this before, the experience that you witnessed that helped you to see more of this quality of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's, his empathy? The inspiration for that article was an episode in the life of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and his brother, Brother Munir Muhammad, of the very excellent show, Muhammad and Friends uh, in Chicago. There was a breach in their relationship that continued for a number of years. And quite frankly, as a student of Minister Farrakhan, there was a period of time during this period of time where there was a breach that I and others view Brother Munir with ambivalence. And so at a certain point, Minister Farrakhan discussed with us reconciling with Brother Munir. And when we were in this particular meeting, Minister Willie, the minister, he asked the question, how do you mend a broken heart? And someone sitting around the table said, well, you know, minister, there's a song called, how do you mend a broken heart? And the minister looked uh, as though he wasn't really familiar with that song. He said, really, I, I would like to hear it. And so someone pulled it up on YouTube and they played How Do You Mend a Broken Heart by Al Green. And the minister sat listening at the words of the song and kind of, you know, looking out into the distance, you know, thinking, reflective, introspective. And as we were listening to that and watching and waiting for what the minister would say next, Someone said, well, you know, Brother Minister, uh, Al Green's version of this song is, is not the original version of this song. The original version was done by the Bee Gees. And so the minister said, really, I, I'd like to hear it. And so they found the Bee Gees version of How Do You Mend a Broken Heart, and they played it for the minister. So for minutes there, we were listening to the BG sing, How Do You Mend a Broken Heart with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And as time would go on and as time would reveal, the minister and Brother Munir began a process uh, of reconciliation. And they came back to being great brothers and friends uh, in a public way once again. And so I learned a lot during that experience because I saw Minister Farrakhan go to great lengths to try to see from his brother's perspective how his brother was feeling and why his brother felt the way he felt regarding the breach in their relationship. And it taught me a lot, you know, 
because a lot of times, and you know this, Minister Willie, because you have done and you continue to do great work uh, resolving beefs, mediating conflicts, helping our people to see that we don't have to kill each other. God has given us the gift of speech. As the Quran says, I've made man of sounding clay. So with the gift of speech and intellect, we can sit across from a table and resolve our differences without resolving to bloodshed. Because even during this pandemic, as I digress, homicide rates are escalating all over the country. That's but I fact. learned in that incident through Minister Farrakhan how to empathize. I learned in that incident, the links that sometimes we have to take, even if we may feel that the other person's grievance against us is unwarranted, is not legitimate. Not to say that the minister felt that way, but I felt a certain kind of way because my orientation is I'm gonna defend Minister Farrakhan. That's, that's, that's me, you know what I mean? So when you take an adversarial position to Minister Farrakhan, you've taken an adversarial position to me. So to see the minister dial that down and then take steps, make effort to try to put himself. See, he was listening to music that put himself in a certain mood, a certain frame of mind to really begin to try to, you know, as the, and I don't, I've never vetted this quote, but they say it's a Native American saying that, you know, you can't know a man or can't judge a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes or his mind. I've never vetted that. So forgive me if that's not accurate. The minister quotes but it too. The principle I know is worthy in the sense that we have to, as a people, you know, learn to try to see things from the other person's perspective, learn to see things from the, the aggrieved person's point of view, because the reality of it is we're not always right. <laughs> you know, we are human beings and we are human beings that have had the unique and horrid experience of having lived under the shadow of Satan. You know, so when the, when the 23rd Psalms talks about the valley of the shadow of death, as black people in America, we could raise our hand and say, you know, we, we know something about that. So we come to our interpersonal relationships with many different type of past injuries, uh, psychological and emotional wounds. And so it's helpful to develop empathy. Empathy doesn't mean I have to agree with you. Empathy that means that I have to respect and acknowledge how you feel and have to be able to have a place within my own mind to examine and to respect how you feel, even if it's not the same way that I feel, because that's one of the first steps in the road to reconciliation, the road to rebuilding broken relationships and so you know, that's just, you know, one example, student minister Willie. Of powerful. The sterling leadership of Minister Farrakhan. Powerful, powerful, powerful. And while we're on that, these last two questions is it's kind of it's it's kind of connected to what you just finished talking about. A brother told me one time, you know, and when he was in an audience with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan dealing with a matter, he told the minister in a respectful way, he wasn't being disrespectful, he was like, Brother Minister, your way is hard, right? You know, he's talking about just like what you just mentioned, you know, how the minister handles stuff, even though we can make a case to say, brother minister, these people really disrespected you. They should be apologizing and how the minister handles it. So my question to you is, how is it that, and I like, can you explain to the audience, what is it, what is the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan's way and why is it such a challenge to others? Minister Farrakhan's way is the way of love. Hear me well. When you see Minister Farrakhan, see, because unless you understand the potentialities, 
comprised within real love, true love. You can't properly assess and identify what we are witnessing when we are witnessing Minister Farrakhan and his life and leadership be on display. So on one hand, Minister Willie, people see a bold man, a powerful man, a courageous man, many black people who have been victimized by the institutions of white supremacy in America, love Minister Farrakhan because he boldly says what we think and feel, but we don't have the courage to say, especially where the white power structure is concerned. So you see that, then you see a man playing classical music on a violin. You see a man who, you know, is so sensitive and tender. So his way is peculiar because these uh, characteristics appear to be polar opposites. You know, we've seen bold and courageous leaders in the black community. You know, we've seen those that speak truth to power, but many times they are not possessed of other components that make them appear to be entirely different human beings. I remember listening to the brother, and I think it's in my book, Who Do They Say I Am? The musical artist M. Tume. And he was talking about Minister Farrakhan as an artist and what art has done to develop him in terms of a leader. It's a very beautiful quote. It's in the book, Who Do They Say I Am? I can't verbatim it. But it just goes to the fact that the minister's way is love. And it's like when you read the scripture, for instance, this is the best way for me to, to, to communicate the point I'm trying to make. So uh, somewhere in the New Testament, I forget, maybe Philippians, I'm not sure. But it says in the English translation, perfect love casts out fear. Now, we've heard that many years, especially if you grew up in a church like I did, perfect love casts out fear. And some of the modern English translations render it more plainly, more eloquently, more beautifully. But growing up, and at that time, the King James Version was the primary version. So it said, perfect love casts out fear. Now, most people think of love as something soft. Even as men, we don't talk about love a whole lot because love is almost like an effeminate kind of thing. Yet the scripture says love is the root of courage. If perfect love casts out fear, then that means if you want to be fearless, you need to deepen and strengthen the quality of your love. So because the minister is motivated out of love, his way is a challenge for all who have yet to develop love as a motivation for what we are doing in the name of helping our people. See, sometimes, Minister Willie, there are people that just want to show off their knowledge. They want to position themselves as they know more than other Black people and all other Black people are dumb or stupid because they don't know what you know or they don't follow what you follow. Yeah, the reality of it is sometimes knowledge makes us very self-righteous and makes us difficult people to be around. We've all seen the brother or the sister that anytime somebody come around them, they got to poke holes or they got to criticize everything that is going on with them. You know, we just came through the Christmas season. This was a difficult year, you know. And quite frankly, as a Muslim, I was happy to see colleagues and family members and people I know be happy, find some kind of joy about Christmas. It wasn't an occasion for me to go into the history of that religious observance. You know, it wasn't the occasion for that because if I love my people, you see, I can find another teachable moment. We can talk about that at another date, but I'm happy that 
out of this difficult year of sadness and pain and struggle and confusion and anxiety, that people could have a moment where they could find some joy, you see. So I learned this from Mr. Farrakhan. I, I remember him saying that I think, and I may <clears throat> have to be corrected a little bit, I remember he talked about, you know, when he grows a harvest on his farm, that sometime he would send his neighbors a bag of beans or something from his harvest during their holiday. It's their holiday. But because the minister is being a good neighbor and being brotherly, again, motivated out of love, then he does these neighborly kinds of things. He's willing to forgive. He's willing to do as the scriptures say God would do. You know, God says at a certain point in the scriptures, Minister Willie, that he would throw our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. He loves us that much. So I see that in Minister Farrakhan. And again, it's challenging. It, I, it, you know, I'm speaking for me. I can't speak for anyone else. You know, it, it's a trial because I know that there's also written of in the scriptures that retaliation is permitted within certain circumstances. But the Quran says it is better if you forgive. So while the rest of us have fastened on to retaliation, the minister is on a higher level and he's quick to forgive. And so I say that it is not for us to remain as we are but we should strive to rise to the level of where he is. Praise be to Allah. That's a be beautiful response. And it's in, in our closing uh, question, you know, many of the readers of the Final Call newspaper know that the centerfold of the paper is traditionally, historically reserved for the words of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And I can only think of three times when someone else's words were printed instead of his. One was, there. I think the guy was from one of these uh, Asian countries, but he was a Muslim. It's one of those countries that then that is Asian, Malaysia, whatever, and he gave a real strong critique about the Islamic world. That was the first time I had ever saw, saw something placed in the centerfold. The second time was uh, during the Holy Day of Atonement in Tuskegee when Brother Ishmael had carried the, uh, the lecture, and, that, and they did the reprint. And the third time was when um, was your column defending the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So my, my parting question is, you know, how did it feel, you know, to, to see you wake up or you get a call or a text like, man, your article is in the center for all the final call newspaper where the ministers was. And did the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan share with you why he decided to do so? You know, it, it's funny because I don't remember the minister and I ever discussing that article. It's really amazing that you ask that question because he did greatly honor me. And you ask how I feel, I would say it's surreal, you know, and I, I kept uh, maybe a couple copies of it. And sometimes I'll look at it if I, you know, have it at hand or it's 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 somewhere where I'm trying to get to something else. And I was like, wow, that really did happen. You know, so it's 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 very surreal. Um and and it was a great honor. Uh obviously you can't sit to write with that as a goal but I appreciated the confirmation that as I was speaking to one of his adversaries, that I would take the approach that he was pleased with. And I, I, I emphasize that as a, a nugget for those of us who are students of Minister Farrakhan, who want to grow and to be representatives of Minister Farrakhan, is that not only should we just study his words, 
That's paramount. But we have to also study his approach as you just asked the question, his way. What is his way? When the minister went to John Conyers commemoration a few years ago, it wasn't long before the minister went there that John Conyers had spoken to press as a result of Jewish community pressure, saying that he disagrees with Minister Farrakhan's statements, et cetera, et cetera. Now, prior to, John Conyers had been a brother and had been a friend to Minister Farrakhan. So when the minister came to his, may have been a retirement gala or something like that, but it was a little tension in the room from the way it was translated to me by Brother Sultan Muhammad, who is a personal assistant to Minister Farrakhan, and he accompanied the minister there. And the minister permitted Brother Sultan to tell us about what happened there. And Brother Sultan shared with us that when it came time for Minister Farrakhan to speak, Minister Farrakhan celebrated all of the things that Representative Conyers had did for him going all the way back to the early days of the rebuilding of the nation. And he said, you know, and this was, I guess you would say a mic drop moment. He says, so if my brother rebukes me, my brother has earned the right to rebuke me. Now, as an asterisk by this story, you know, again, I told you, you know, I, I'm, I always react as best I can to defend Minister Farrakhan. And I had defended Minister Farrakhan against John Conyers. And so, but the minister's position was that he was willing to absorb the rebuke of his brother instead of retaliating against his brother. Another very, very powerful uh, lesson uh, for us. So I felt that with that centerfold article, as well as with the book that we started the conversation talking about, but didn't you kill Malcolm? Uh, and there have been some other instances where he has specifically told me that uh, I approached it in the way that he would. Uh, I, I felt gratified that um, he recognized in what I wrote, his way and his approach, the very sensitive and very complex yet important subjects. For me, uh, that was a grade that I'm making some progress in not just being a student or spokesperson but I'm making some progress and maybe one day I can be called a representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farquhar. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. And brother, I, uh, praise be to Allah. And I really thank you for your, for, um, just for your time. And, and I was gonna text you and tell you this, but I'll just say it publicly, man. Even, I love your tone in the way that you do the interviews and it reminds me of the Honorable Minister Louis Farquhar spirit and his tone and how he answers, how he answers questions, especially now as in this age and how, you know, he, he, he's, he, he still is Lewis, the Lewis Farrakhan in, in, in Moss number seven, but mature and grown and more, you know, about it. And, and I love how you, you, your, your responses, it reminds me of such. So my brother, I thank you for, for the time that you gave. I thank you for, um, your words, I thank you for your scholarship. And I thank many of those who are here, if you get the opportunity to see the comments, they appreciate, appreciate it as well. And what I will encourage those who are actually watching, we started off the show talking about, our brother was talking about the Malcolm X um, <clears throat> controversy. So what I would encourage you all to do, brothers and sisters, is order this book. I know sometimes we get into this thing on, on social media where we're going back and forth with people about the Malcolm X controversy and things of that nature in which I understand all of that.
But one of the things that I'm doing now, before I start engaging with people like that, I send them a link to Brother Dimitri's book. I send them a, a link to interviews that he has done, articles that he has done on, on this particular issue. And, and say, if they are serious, you will get this book. You will go and read or watch these articles. So I encourage you, believers, if you do not have our brother's book, go and get that book. Do that right now. And also, you see, he has a host of other books he talked about, right? You can go to research.com and you can actually find those uh, books and make sure you order them. Because I know we're watching YouTube with the little clips on the videos. Those are good, but nothing can replace the actual reading. Remember what Allah revealed to Prophet Muhammad in, in the Holy Quran, the very first uh, surah, he said, Ikra, read. And he said, and our Lord would be, you know, he's the most generous, that God wants to give us something. So make sure you actually go in and actually do this. And also I will add this, if you have connections to anybody that's on these college campuses, because you know, Black History Month is coming up and they're gonna be talking about Malcolm X. When you see these people on social media and all of this stuff talking about Malcolm X, ask them, I don't wanna give up, your schedule gonna be full, Brother Dimitri, but ask them to for the possibility to have our brother to come on and talk about this scholarship that he has, he has, Allah has blessed him to write regarding this controversy. So thank you, Brother Dimitri. We're gonna to get to our closing announcements. As I always say to those who are watching, if you have it, you know, we are here in the city of New Orleans, we're working to pay off our mortgage. So whatever you can actually donate, we will greatly appreciate. You can do it via Cash App. We, you can also um, go to PayPal. You can go to mosque46.org and you can give a contribution. We will greatly, greatly appreciate it. Also during this COVID and Anything else, if you need someone to say a prayer on the behalf of you or your family that may be going through something like others have been doing, please submit your name. <clears throat> please submit the name of your family members so that we can actually say a prayer on their behalf as well. And inshallah, on next Sunday, which is January the 17th. Oh, Lord, not Lord. Look at me. Please excuse that, that typo. That's my fault. That's my I did that. But on, on not January the 3rd, people, January the 17th, we're going to have our sister, Dr. Patrice Muhammad. When I say Dr. Patrice, she is a medical doctor. Dr. Patrice Muhammad, she'll be on live on I Have a Testimony, January the 17th, 1 p.m. So make sure you share this flyer. Make sure you tune in. Once again, I want to give props out to the brother and sister who are behind the board, making everything look so beautiful. Our sister, sister Kenya, and our brother, brother Musai. Thank you all. I couldn't do this without you all. And also salute to NNV. Make sure you go to NNV's YouTube page and subscribe. We want to build up the subscription for National Network View. So thank you all for tuning in to I Have a Testimony. Please continue to share your thoughts with us in the comment section below as you have been doing. Follow us on social media. And this is your brother, brother Willie Muhammad with National Network View. Peace. God came to us to seek and to save that which was lost. He raised the man from among us. He, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, laid the foundation. What I'm doing is something that comes from him through me and the thing that he uses in me to do the work is my faith in him and the word that he taught to produce men and women who wanted to clean up their life and build an independent nation for the glory of God. Be a part of the force that powers truth in journalism. Your support helps to combat false media. Cash App NNV News.